Hi everyone, and welcome to the DAPS on Nervos CKB Workshop Part 2, On-Chain Scripts with Capsule. My name is Jordan, and I'll be narrating today's presentation, which was originally created by Shuji. This is a multi-part workshop, and will cover the entire process of developing a modern DAP, including all on-chain and off-chain components required to build on Nervos CKB. This workshop is divided into four parts, and today we'll be covering Part 2. Capsule Framework, a tool created specifically for writing on-chain smart contracts in Rust. Today's presentation contains three parts. First, I'll introduce the script validation workflow. Next, I'll introduce the Capsule Framework for writing smart contracts in Rust. And finally, I'll walk through a demo application. First, we'll cover the script validation workflow. This is the process that must be followed by a transaction to be committed to chain. This consists of the scripts which form a smart contract, as well as the protocols of Nervos CKB. Today we'll focus specifically on the scripts. This is an example of a transaction with six cells. Every cell has a lock script, and some cells have a type script. When a transaction is submitted, these scripts will execute in a specific order. First, the lock scripts will execute on all input cells. This ensures that proper authority was supplied to every input. Lock scripts validate authority, therefore they only need to run on the inputs, but not the outputs. Next, the type scripts will execute on all input and output cells. The type script is optional, so it only executes where it is present. Type scripts validate state changes, so they must run on both inputs and outputs. In order for a transaction to fully validate, every script that executes must return without error. If any script fails validation, the entire transaction is rejected and cannot be committed to chain. Every transaction contains both inputs and outputs. The inputs represent the current state and the outputs represent the future state. Because of this, modified data in a transaction is always consistent and deterministic. It doesn't matter if a transaction confirms quickly or isn't submitted until a week later. Assuming the transaction is valid and confirms, the resulting state is always guaranteed to match what was represented in the outputs at the time it was signed. At the highest level, both lock scripts and type scripts serve a similar purpose. When they execute, they both validate the current transaction. Both have access to all of the transaction details, including all of the input and output cells within it. However, when they execute is different, and this means that the concerns are also different. The concern of a lock script is ownership. It validates the security of a cell. It contains the conditions that must be met in order for a cell to be unlocked. The most common method is SCCP 256 K1 signature validation, which is used for basic transaction signing. Time based conditions are also common. Complex conditions based on the structure and data within a transaction are also common for more advanced smart contracts. The concern of a TypeScript is state changes. That makes it suitable for smart contract logic. It contains all of the conditions that must be met in order to change the state of a cell. One of the most common examples of TypeScript usage is for the creation of user-defined tokens, or UDTs for short. They are fungible tokens similar to what you would see on other smart contract platforms, and their common usage is for currency or utility tokens that pay for a service. Another example of TypeScript usage is for non-fungible tokens, or NFTs for short. Non-fungible tokens are each unique and can have differing attributes and values. They are useful for things like the popular CryptoKitties game. NFTs are also well suited for tickets to concert or sporting events. Each NFT can have unique values, meaning it can easily map to a unique seat in an arena or theater. The 2020 UEFA European Football Championship, which has now been postponed to 2021, used a blockchain-based NFT system to handle part of their ticket sale. A TypeScript may operate differently from a typical smart contract using the account model, but ultimately much of the practical usage is the same. At the end of today's workshop, we will demonstrate a complete on-chain script, including all aspects from writing the script to testing to deployment. As mentioned earlier, when a transaction executes, first lock scripts execute on all input cells, then type scripts execute on all input and output cells. If we look closely at the cells in this transaction, you will notice that each of the lock scripts and type scripts has a number. This is indicating the uniqueness of the scripts. In a transaction, it is possible to have the same script used on multiple cells. The top two cells in the left column both use lock script 1. Lock scripts indicate ownership, so this is indicating that they have the same owner. 
The logic needed to unlock these two cells is exactly the same. Either they're both going to unlock, or they're both going to fail validation. Because they are exactly the same, execution only needs to occur once for both of them. Before execution, a deduplication process occurs, which ensures that only unique scripts get executed. In the green text you will see a total of six scripts, but after deduplication there are only four unique scripts that will be executed. It's also important to point out that the order of script execution doesn't matter. Scripts do not generate data. All the data is already present in the transaction. A script validates a transaction, but it can't modify it in any way, meaning there are never any unintended side effects. Every script is always presented with the same transaction data, so the result is always the same. Therefore, the actual order of execution has no impact on the end result. Next, we'll cover the script group concept. Every script that is executed on-chain will have a corresponding script group for the transaction. The script group contains all of the cells in the transaction that use the currently executing script. This becomes a very convenient resource that scripts can utilize when performing validation on cells. The script group for lock script 1 is shown with the orange arrows. This group contains cell A and cell B. When lock script 1 executes, it can easily call this group to quickly gain access to cell A and B without having to iterate through all of the input cells available to find those with a matching lock script. The script group for type script 1 is shown with the white arrows. This group contains cell A and cell E. The script group for type script 2 is shown with the yellow arrows. This group contains only cell D. Similarly, the script group for cell C would only contain cell C. Cell F would not be included in any script group because lock scripts do not execute on outputs. In actual usage, when a script is executed, it is responsible for all the cells in the corresponding script group. For example, when lock script 1 is executed, it is responsible for validating the signatures of both cell A and cell B. To do this, it must loop through all of the relevant cells and check the signatures during each iteration. This can be accomplished by using syscalls in two different ways. The first is to use a syscall to read all input cells. This would load cell A, cell B, and cell C in sequential order. On each iteration, the cell data would be loaded. The logic within the lock script would first verify and check that the cell uses lock script 1. If it does, then it would proceed to validate the signature. If the cell does not use lock script 1, then it would skip over the current cell and continue processing the next cells until all have been processed. This would work fine, but there is a better way. There's a specific syscall to load all the input cells within the script group. This would only load cell A and cell B because they have the same lock script. Using this helps simplify the processing. On each iteration, the logic can be simplified to skip directly to validating the signatures since the script group only contains the cells matching the current lock script. A similar process would also occur for lock script 2. When lock script 2 makes a syscall for the script group input cells, only cell C will be returned. By using the script group, the number of input cells that needs to be processed drops from 3 to 1. When TypeScript 1 executes, the script group will contain cell A and cell E, because those are the cells which match the currently executing script. By analyzing the attributes and data within cell A and cell E, it can be judged whether or not the transformation complies with the rules set forth by the developer. For example, if the TypeScript used in cell A and cell E was for a token, then it would check the number of tokens in both cell A and cell E and verify that cell E did not have more tokens than cell A. This ensures that tokens were not created from nothing. Many scripts will rely on the script group in some way, but it's not uncommon for a script to read all of the input or all of the output cells. More advanced scripts may include functionality that requires them to analyze cells outside of their own script group. This opens up the door for highly complex interactions between multiple scripts in a single transaction. And it is all of the scripts in a single transaction that cooperate together to form a smart contract on Nervos. Both the lock script and TypeScript are nearly identical in design. The data structure, execution method, and the data that can be accessed are all the same. The only difference is when they are executed. Within a transaction, all lock scripts on all input cells are executed, and all type scripts on all cells will be executed. It is because of this difference in execution time that the use cases will also be different. We provide a number of suggested use cases and common patterns for the design of dApps. 
However, developers who are pushing the boundaries of what can be done may find that our suggestions do not always fit their use cases. If that's truly the case, you should disregard our recommendations and use your own methods. Nervos is built with flexibility as a core principle to empower the developer. We provide solutions to help whenever possible, but it's ultimately up to the developer to choose the best possible route. We covered the execution of lock scripts and type scripts. Next, we'll look at the structure of a script. The data structure of a script contains three fields. The first is code hash. This is a 32-byte hash value, and it serves as a reference to the code that we'll execute. The second is hash type. This is a flag that is set to either data or type. We'll explain the significance of this later. The third is args, which is short for arguments. These are values that are passed to the script executable, similar to how you would pass arguments to a normal program. The structure and data contained in the args field is defined by the developer, so it may be implemented differently for each script. For example, a lock script could contain a user's public key hash as an argument to show who the owner is. A type script for a UDT token may contain a unique identifier for the token itself. The script data structure itself does not contain the executable script code in any of these three fields. Next, we'll look at where the code itself resides. In Nervos, the terms script and script code refer to different concepts. A script is a data structure with three fields, code hash, hash type, and args. This data structure is present in every cell within a transaction. When we use the term script code, or on-chain script, we're talking about the RISC-V code that is executed on CKBVM. Even though they are different, sometimes script and script code are interchangeably used in conversation. So it's important to always pay attention to the context. Next, we'll look at cell depths. A cell dep, or dep for short, stands for dependency. It's a resource needed by a transaction. The structure of a cell dep is similar to that of an input cell. Just like an input, a dep refers to a live cell, which is a cell that has not been consumed or used as an input to a transaction previously. In this example, both input cells and cell deps refer to live cells, but how they will be treated after the transaction executes is very different. Once the transaction is committed to chain, the input cells are consumed. This frees up the capacity in those cells and converts them from live cells to dead cells. Once a cell is dead, it cannot be used again as an input or a dep. The process of cell consumption is very similar to the UTXO model of Bitcoin which inspired it. So sometimes the terms unspent and spent are used instead of live cell and dead cell. These terms effectively mean the same thing in Nervos. Cell depths that are included in a transaction are not consumed. This means that they remain live cells and can be reused again in another transaction. Looking at the left side of the example, you will see that the input cells are consumed and marked as dead cells. The two cell depths are not consumed and remain unchanged. Looking at the right side of the example, you will see two cells to the right side of the arrow. These are the output cells that are being created in place of the input cells that were consumed. This is how a state change occurs on Nervos. The input cells are the old state, and they are destroyed. The output cells are the new state, and they are being created in place. The cell depths are pieces of state that are read-only and do not change. After this transaction is executed successfully, there will be four live cells. The two input cells are destroyed, and two output cells are created. The two cells referenced as cell depths remain unchanged and are still live cells. Let's look a little deeper at a cell depth. Each cell contains a data field which can contain any form of data. When script code is saved on-chain, it is saved to the data area of a cell. When we need to use this script code in a transaction, we refer to it using cell depth. This allows the script code that resides in the data field of the cell to be repeatedly used since the cell itself is not consumed. Next, we'll look at the life cycle of an on-chain script. Script code can be written in any language as long as it can compile to a RISC-V binary program. Today, this includes C, Rust, JavaScript, and many other languages, but we recommend Rust for most applications. Once you have your script code binary ready, it needs to be put on the blockchain so that it can be used. To do this, a cell is created and the binary is included in the data field of that cell. There is nothing different about a cell that contains script code. The cell is created as an output in a transaction just like any other normal cell. Once this transaction has been committed to chain, the script code is present in a live cell that can be used in a transaction. This is done by including the script code cell in a transaction as a cell dep, 
then referencing the hash of the script code in a lock script or TypeScript of another cell. This allows the same script code to be reused over and over again by an unlimited amount of scripts. The last step in the life cycle of a script is the optional process of consumption. If the script is no longer needed, or it's being replaced by a newer version, then the developer can consume the cell to reclaim the CK bytes which are used to store the data. When a cell is consumed, it is marked as a dead cell and removed from the active state of the network. This means that the script code that is in the data area can no longer be used for any reason. If a smart contract relies on script code from a cell that is consumed, then it will no longer function. On Nervos, this problem can be rectified easily by redeploying the script code into a new live cell. If a widely used resource is deployed, it can be made permanent by setting the lock script argument to all zeros. This is similar to how burning is done on other blockchains by sending to an address of all zeros. No one possesses a private key that will be able to unlock this cell, so no one will be able to consume it in the future. Next, we'll cover how a script resolves dependencies during transaction execution. If you look at the script on the left, it has two fields, code hash and hash type. The code hash value is used to match against a cell dependency, and the hash type indicates what type of value should be used to match. Every cell contains a data hash and a type hash. The data hash is a Blake2B hash of the cell's data. If script code was in the cell's data field, then this would be a hash of the script code itself. The type hash is a Blake2B hash of the TypeScript structure in raw bytes. Both of these hashes are available for every cell. Here you see a single script and four cell dependencies. In order to execute the script code, the code hash is used to locate the correct dependency. The hash type is data, therefore the script knows it must match a cell dependency using the data hash. The script's code hash is AADD, and celldep4 has a data hash of AADD, creating a successful match. This matching process is identical between lock scripts and type scripts. In this example, the code hash is beef and the hash type is data. If we run through the cell dependencies, none exist with the data hash of beef. There is one with a type hash of beef, but this does not match because the hash type is data, not type. Since no match is found, the script will not be able to execute and the transaction would fail. In this example, the code hash is 1234 and the hash type is data. Looking at the cell dependencies, there are two that match. If you recall from earlier, the data hash is a Blake2B hash of the actual data in the cell. This means that both of these cells contain the exact same script code, so it doesn't matter which one is actually executed. This transaction would execute successfully, but keep in mind that this is just an example. In practical usage, you probably wouldn't have two instances of the exact same script code deployed on-chain, since this is a waste of resources. In this example, the code hash is AADD and the hash type is type. Looking at the cell dependencies, there is a data hash of AADD, but since our hash type is type, we must match against the type hash field, not the data hash field. There is no match, so the script execution would fail. In this final example, the code hash is ABCD and the hash type is type. Looking at the cell dependencies, both cell dep1 and cell dep4 match this. Now look at the data hash for these two cell depths. One is 1234 and the other is AADD. The data hash is based on the actual content of the data in the cell, so we know that these two cell depths have different script code. There is no way to determine which script code should run, so this transaction would fail. In summary, the combination of code hash and hash type in a script uniquely defines the script code to be run. And the script code itself lives in the data area of a live cell, which is later referenced in the transaction using the cell dependencies. Earlier we introduced the structure of a script, which contains the code hash, hash type, and args fields. The code hash and hash type are used to specify the script code. The args field is used to instantiate the script. For those who are familiar with object-oriented programming, the script code is similar to a class, and the args are the values which are used to construct the instance. Looking at the table, we have a few examples of how args can be used in different scripts. The first line is the SACP 256K1 verification script. This is the default lock script that is used on Nervos. The argument passed is the public key hash of the owner. This allows the lock script to be reused for anyone. 
All that needs to be changed is the public key hash and the arguments. The second line is a UDT TypeScript. The argument passed is a UDT identifier. This allows an unlimited amount of unique UDT tokens to be created that all share the same underlying script code. All that needs to be changed is the identifier and the arguments. This is very different from Ethereum's ERC-20 standard. On Ethereum, every token is created from a unique on-chain script. It doesn't matter if the underlying source code is identical. The script code must be added to the blockchain for each token since there is no option for code reuse. On Nervos, the option exists to both reuse existing script code or create new script code if you require additional functionality. Hundreds or even thousands of tokens can easily be created with a single code base without having to bloat the blockchain with unnecessary duplicate code. The third line is a time-based lock script. The argument passed is a timestamp that indicates a date in the future when the lock should be released. This allows the lock script to be reused easily for any date without having to change the underlying code. Next, we'll look at an example of how to implement a UDT on-chain script. This is an example of a UDT transfer. Alice has 1,000 of token A. She wants to send 100 to Bob and keep the remaining 900 for herself. The logic of the UDT TypeScript must inspect this transaction to ensure that it is valid. The input cell has 1,000 of token A, and the output cells combined have a total of 1,000 of token A. This transaction is valid and would be allowed to commit to chain. In this example, Alice has 1,000 of token A, and she wants to send 500 to Bob and keep 900 for herself. The input cell has 1,000 of token A, and the output cells combined have a total of 1,400 of token A. There are not enough tokens in the inputs to cover the outputs meaning additional token minting would be required to fulfill it. Under normal circumstances, a user is not allowed to mint tokens out of nothing. Therefore, this transaction is invalid and would be rejected. Here we have a flowchart that explains the logic of a basic UDT TypeScript. Starting from the top left corner, the first step is to check if the transaction was created by the owner of the token. By owner, we mean the user who first created the token and has administrative privileges. If the owner is detected, the script will immediately return successfully, considering any action as valid. If the owner is not detected, then the script continues execution. The script will scan through the inputs and count up all of the token balances of all the token cells. It will then do the same with the outputs. Once it has the input and output balances, it compares them to ensure that the input balance is greater than or equal to the output balance. This ensures that a user without administrative privileges cannot mint tokens out of nothing. If the balances of the inputs and outputs are as expected, then the script returns successfully. A TypeScript has two roles on Nervos CKV, identification and security. While executing a UDT TypeScript, the script ensures that the issuance rules are always followed, providing security. For example, if Alice has 1,000 tokens, the UDT TypeScript ensures that Alice cannot create outputs with more than 1,000 tokens. This logic ensures that no tokens can be minted out of nothing. When a dApp is constructing or analyzing a transaction, it can look at the TypeScript that is used, providing a means of identification. A TypeScript validates state changes. Another way to think of this is that the TypeScript defines the behavior of the cell. By identifying what TypeScript is used in a cell, you know how the cell is expected to behave in a transaction. Wallets also benefit from this because it helps them to identify the intent of a transaction before the user is prompted to sign. Next, we'll cover the topic of type ID, which provides a way to guarantee a unique type script. From the earlier example, you'll see that cell dep1 and cell dep4 have the same type hash. However, each of these cells contains different script code. This can make things more complicated to manage or even threaten security if a malicious user can forge a type hash and inject their own script code. The solution to this is to create a globally unique type hash that can never be used again. This can be accomplished using the type ID script. One of the fundamental problems blockchain solves is double spending. Nervos enforces this by only allowing a cell to be consumed once. Looking at the example, there are two transactions. All of the inputs are unique cells. These two transactions can be submitted to chain without problems. In this example, there is a problem. Both transactions are using cell 1 as an input. Once a cell is used as an input, it is consumed, converting it from a live cell into a dead cell and preventing it from being used again. The second transaction would fail because a cell can only be consumed once. 
we can use this property to guarantee uniqueness when combined with the type ID script. In this example, we are creating a new type ID using what we refer to as the seed cell pattern. Cell 3 is an output being created using the type ID TypeScript. A hash of cell 1 is being included as an argument to the script. Cell 1 is an input that will be consumed. On Nervos CKB, every cell has a unique hash and can only be consumed once. Therefore, the type ID cell that includes a hash of cell 1 can never be used again and is guaranteed to be unforgeable. During a type ID update operation, the TypeScript will verify that there is a one-to-one -one ratio in the inputs and outputs. Cell 1 and Cell 3 both use the type ID TypeScript and have the same arguments, which creates a match that the script can check. The rules of the type ID TypeScript are as follows. If the transaction has more than one input cell using the current type ID script, reject the transaction. If the transaction has more than one output cell using the current type ID script, reject the transaction. If no input cell uses the current type ID script, calculate the hash of the first input in the transaction. If the resulting hash does not match the arguments of the current type ID script, reject the transaction. Rules 1 and 2 ensure a proper one-to-one -one cell conversion for an existing type ID cell and allow pass-through for other cases. Rule 3 ensures that a new type ID cell being created for the first time must use a seed cell. The three rules combined ensure that every type ID cell created is unique and that only one live cell with that unique type ID will ever exist at any given time. The life cycle begins with a new type ID cell being created using a seed cell to create a unique identifier. The data can then be updated by consuming the existing type ID cell and creating exactly one new output cell. Finally, the type ID cell can be destroyed once it is no longer needed and the capacity in the cell can be recovered. We mentioned earlier that a TypeScript on Nervo CKB has two roles, identification and security. Both the UDD script we introduced earlier and the type ID script also fulfill these two roles. The type ID script provides identification, which is used to create a unique pointer to script code. This allows a unique cell to be located that conforms to expected behavior. The type ID also ensures security. This gives guarantees against self-forgery since only a single cell can exist at any given time with a particular type ID. By combining these two qualities, we can ensure that only one live cell can exist when the data in the cell is updated. Next, we'll introduce Polyjuice. Polyjuice is a compatibility layer that allows Ethereum EVM contracts to run on Nervos CKB. This is done without any modifications or special provisions being made to the platform, and it demonstrates the flexibility of CKB VM. To achieve this, an EVM implementation must first be compiled to a RISC-V binary. Next, a smart contract written in any Ethereum language, such as Solidity, must be compiled to EVM bytecode. Nervos CKB can then execute the EVM bytecode smart contract using the EVM implementation to generate a result. All EVM opcodes are supported without any compatibility issues. Most Solidity contracts can be taken and run directly on CKB VM without modification. Next, we'll discuss how to write an on-chain script using the Capsule Framework. Capsule Framework is a tool developed by Nervos to build on-chain scripts using the Rust programming language. Capsule is used for the full development cycle, including development, debugging, unit testing, and the final chain deployment. When using Capsule, scripts are written completely in standard Rust code. There are no intermediary transpilers of any kind. The standard Rust compiler is used without any modifications. One of the design considerations that we wanted to achieve was to allow developers to use the complete offerings of the Rust ecosystem. We wanted developers to be able to take advantage of the tried and tested production grade tools that already exist. The Rust ecosystem is growing every day, and those improvements can be used directly by anyone building on Nervos. Looking at the code example, you see an on-chain script written in Rust. A bit of encapsulation was done to support the RISC-V environment, but this is normal Rust code that is built with the standard Rust compiler. The two functions, loadscript and loadtxhash, are syscalls which are used to interact with the blockchain. Loadscript gets the currently executing scripts so that the arguments which are passed can be parsed. Parsing the arguments is a very common requirement in many scripts. For example, the default SCCP-256K1 lock script has to parse the public key hash which is stored in the arguments. The UDT TypeScript parses the arguments to get the identifier of the UDT. In addition to loading the current script, you can also access all of the details of a transaction. 
This includes the input cells, output cells, header depths, cell depths, and the transaction hash itself. The loadTX hash function is provided to get the current transaction hash. This is done to simplify the signature verification process. A signature needs to cover the entire transaction. All parts of the transaction are included in the transaction hash except for the witness, which holds the signatures. This makes it easy to implement a complete verification process since the script has access to all the pieces required. At present time, capsule scripts operate using no standard mode. This means that the Rust standard library is not used. However, most of the regularly used structures are still available through libraries. Common structures such as vectors and B-tree maps are available, and the number of new libraries is always growing. Next, we'll look at a non-fungible token example and how it's implemented. We'll focus on some of the basics in this video, and more will be included in part 3. A draft specification is currently available for NFT. The script that we will look at today is implemented to match this draft specification. For anyone who wants to learn more, the specification is available on the Nervos Talk forum and the implementation is available on GitHub. However, keep in mind that this is a draft spec and it may be subject to change in the future. The dApps on CKB Workshop Code repository contains the full source code. The scripts that we will talk about today are in the NFT validator folder. The NFT glue folder contains code that interacts with the blockchain, and this will be used in part three of the workshop. The NFT validator commits are organized in a way to demonstrate the process of writing a complete script. Starting with a basic skeleton template, each step builds on the previous, adding new pieces of functionality. Let's look at the workflow of the NFT script. Starting on the left side, the process begins. The NFT script detects if governance mode is active and stores the result in a variable. Next, a loop is executed to check if there are more NFTs that need to be processed in the output cells. If there are not, the process completes successfully. If there are more, then it proceeds to check if the same NFT exists in the inputs, which would indicate transfer behavior. If the same NFT does not exist in the inputs, then it checks the governance variable we set earlier. If governance mode is not enabled, then the operation is rejected because only the owner can create new NFTs. If governance mode is enabled, then the NFT ID is calculated using the seed cell pattern, similar to the type ID TypeScript. If the NFT ID in the cell being created has a hash that doesn't match the seed cell, then the operation is rejected. This ensures that the NFT cells can only be created in the expected way using a seed cell. If the NFT ID is correct, then the process starts again with the next output. If no more outputs remain, then the process completes successfully. Next, we'll take a look at the demo. I went ahead and I set up a development environment to work with. On the left, I cloned the dApps on CKB Workshop repository, and we're going to focus on the NFT validator section. On the right, I installed the CKB blockchain, and it's running in a local blockchain configuration. And in the bottom right, you'll see the miner running, and I went ahead and I sped that up so it's a one block per second. So what we're looking at here is the dApps on CKB Workshop code repository, and I've pulled up the NFT validator contract. So this top block here is mostly just basic boilerplate and some imports, but the one that you want to pay attention to is this right here, the CKB standard library. Uh, this is very useful and has a lot of the functions that we're going to need to work with pretty regularly. Uh, so especially the high level functions, uh, these are the most useful and, and we generally recommend you stick to this as much as possible. And you can find all the information you need about these on the documentation URL here. So if we scroll down a little bit here, we have the main program entry point. And this is the function that actually returns to CKBVM, and it's just returning a um, an 8-bit integer. The uh, main function, which is, is kind of like a real main function, returns a uh, result. So we're actually just mapping that to, to a basic integer, which we need. And then the next section here is our error codes. Uh, these first four are basic system error codes. And then we add in our, our custom error codes, which are used for the actual smart contract itself. And if you see here, this, um, this is actually mapping the system errors directly to these first four errors here. So we never need to touch any of this code. This is just some of the boilerplate to do that. Uh, but when you're putting together your smart contract, this is where you want to put in your error codes and um, you can continue to add in as many as necessary. 
So if we scroll down a little bit further, we come across the main function, the real main function where the program actually begins. So the load script here is pulling in the currently running script. And um, that corresponds to what we see here, but it's not the actual script code. If you remember from earlier, a script is actually just the code hash, hash type, and the arguments. So this block here is it's pulling out the arguments and it's grabbing the first 32 bytes of that, which is the governance lock hash. And then if we look at the next section here, this is going through all of the um, the lock hashes which in, are in the input and it's comparing them to the governance lock hash that was in the arguments to see if we find a match. Um, so this query iter here, this is a very helpful function here. This takes any of the CKB standard high level functions. Well, not all of them, but some of them. And uh, you can run it against a source and it will pull them into an iterator here that you can just use. And so the any method here is, is off of an iterator. And what it does is whenever this match is true, it stops executing the rest of them after it's found a single one. So this is very helpful. This is um, some of the most optimized code you can have. And it's also very readable to do this basic operation. Looking at the next block of code here, uh, we have the NFT data loader. And this was uh, put together. What it does is it scans through the, the group input and it runs this function over it, which um, is actually doing a fairly simple process here. It's basically just pulling out the uh, first 32 bytes. Uh, but because load cell data will um, return an error, a uh, length not long enough if your buffer is smaller than the data that actually came out of there, we needed to wrap that in a match to pull that out. So scrolling down a little bit further, we have this block of code here. And this looks fairly complicated, but it's actually not doing all that much. Uh, first, it just loads the current script hash. That's so the script hash of, of this script here that's actually running. And then we um, go through all of the outputs and we find all of their type hashes. And we find just those that match the current script hash. And the reason we would do this is because in CKB, it's a good idea to have your script only be concerned with a similar cell and not affect the rest of the transaction because that way we can put many different scripts and batch them into one large transaction and they can be doing completely unrelated things. Uh, so we only want to have them be concerned with uh, the minimal amount possible, which is the other script instances. Continuing down, we have the final block of code here. So this goes through each of the outputs that we found above in the previous step and it's checking each of them to see if it's a transfer operation, in which case it's, it's the no more work is needed, or if it was a new NFT being generated. And in the latter case, it's going through and it's uh, calculating the hashes and it's checking it against the actual data within the um, data field of the cell out in the output to verify that it's actually correct. If you want to read more about the specification that was used to develop this code, look for the CKB NFT draft specification RFC, and you'll find that on talk.nervos.org. Next, we'll build the script using capsule. To do that, you just use the capsule build command. And this will take a few seconds. This is building it using debug mode. And you can also build it in release mode by putting release at the end. If we look at the directory tree that was created, you'll see that both of them are under the build folder under debug and release. And these binaries are very different in size. I believe that the debug version is about 3.7 megabytes and the release version is only 33K. So um, you'll wanna use the debug version when you're testing, uh, but the release version is of course what's going to actually go on chain. You're never going to want to Put a debug version into production because you're going to end up paying a huge amount of capacity fees which are unnecessary. Next we'll run the unit tests using the capsule test command. This will run through all the available tests and give you a pass fail on all of them and you can also do the same with release at the end and just like the other commands it's just as the same with the release 
the release version, if you noticed, the release version executed a lot faster and with much fewer cycles. Next, we'll take a look at deployment. Here I have deployment.toml open, and this is used by Capsule to assign a lock script to the cells that we deploy. And it needs to be configured here, because right now the lock argument is all zeros, which is owned by nobody. So first we need to go into CKB CLI, where I've created a couple of accounts. So I just need to take one of my accounts here. I'm gonna take this one right here, and we just paste that over that and save it, and we're done. And if you need help, uh, setting up a development node. We have a tutorial for that on um, our docs site, docs.nervos.org, and just look for the dev blockchain tutorial. To do the actual deployment, we'll use the capsule deploy command, and it has a couple arguments that we'll go through here. The first one is the address. The address specified here is just any address that you own that has capacity on it uh, so that it has something that it can actually pull from to do to handle the, the transaction fees and the capacity required to create the cell. And then I specified the fee amount here because the default was giving me an error, so I increased it just slightly. So if we continue with that, it'll give you a bunch of information here about the TX hash, the data hash, and everything about the, the deployment. And if we just confirm it, it'll prompt you for the password. This is the password to the account that we specified up at the top. And it's done. In a few seconds, we should see it, there it goes, uh, that it just went ahead and processed that in one of the next blocks. Every time Capsule does a deployment, it creates a migration file. These are located in the migrations dev folder, and this contains all the details about the deployment that we need to locate that cell again that was just deployed. And so you want to keep this handy because we're going to be using this in workshop part three. If you get stuck, we're here to help. We recommend that you join our Discord server's dev chat chat room. And for those who prefer Telegram, we have the Nervos Network CKB dev chat room. My name's Jordan. You can find me on Discord, Telegram, and Twitter. Feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any questions about this presentation or about Nervos in general. Thanks for watching.